brief stint as a research assistant, uh, research scientist, sorry, at JPL, before becoming an assistant professor at, of astronomy at George Mason University. Um, in 2010, she moved to Boston University, where she's now a full professor in the astronomy department. Um, she's won several awards, including NSF Youth Investigative Career Award and the President Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Um, last year, she was the William Bentick Smith Fellow at Harvard Radcliffe Institute. And she's currently running a large interdisciplinary um, center called the SHIELD Center that's aimed at understanding the basic nature of the heliosphere. Um, something you won't find on her uh, website is that uh, she loves art and had at one point, I guess, ambitions to be a mu uh, movie director or a writer. <laughs> so she's been a major force in the ongoing attempt to understand our, our current day heliosphere, um, but she has other interests as well, and today she'll be telling us about some interesting work she's doing on um, an earlier time in our heliosphere. Thanks. I think, yeah, good, the microphone is on. Um, let me stand here. Um, Thank you for the invitation and thank you for the introduction, John. Um, let, let me start, start by, by also, also thanking the scientific my collaborators, my, my fellows, and particularly and my and Alex, Alex Warden, uh, because, uh, because I, started I started thinking about it, about it. I had the privilege to be a fellow, so I had a year not teaching, not doing anything else, and thinking, thinking about, about what, what the use of her would look like, like in the past, past. And, and the, the consequences, consequences for climate, for climate and um, biology, biology and, and some of the stuff, stuff we're talking, talking this other 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 fellows from the ocean, ocean, ocean and biology, and biology came, came walking, walking to my office and, and started start collaborating. So, so it's, a, it's, it's a, a, um, a little, little bit of crazy ideas, but I hope it will inspire you on a possible new direction. Okay, so let me start close to my, my home, home uh, my, my field, field is that is related with astrospheres. So, so let me let introduce the idea, idea of what, what um, um, ast astrospheres are. You might not be familiar, so let me introduce what are astrospheres. And they are the bubble formed by wings that the, almost all stars have wings, and they blow those wings out. And those stars are also not um, static, they move. And as they move with the wind, their wind get deflected by the motion, creating a cocoon. So I like to look um, at night and the, um, to the sky and think that every single star that I'm looking there is actually enveloped by a cocoon. <coughs> it's hard to see most, uh, for most stars, the cocoons. Here are some um, astronomical images of some of astrospheres, some cocoons. Those are massive stars. So they blow really powerful winds, so you can see them. Most stars, the winds are very rarefied, so it's really hard to see astrospheres. But think that every single star is not naked, but it's enveloped by this astrosphere. Why we're interested in astrospheres? Because astrospheres protect planets. <coughs> Most system, and I'm going to argue here, um, that maybe some system are not completely enveloping the planets, but we think that most planets um, are embedded within this big envelope. This envelope is much larger than the planets. And the other aspect that is interesting in our um, bubble that we call the heliosphere, instead of just an astrosphere, we see the effect of shielding that protect us as a planet. So here are, is a picture, I hope you can see by the, um, it's not super powerful, my laser pointer, but this is the intensity of radiation of galactic cosmic rays, and I'm talking about galactic cosmic rays below 1 GeV, so not super energetic, but below 1 GeV, galactic cosmic rays sense the presence of the heliosphere, and they get shielded, and this plot is pretty amazing, this is the intensity of galactic cosmic rays as the spacecraft Voyager measure from when it was launched 77. As it's adventure out of the solar system, the intensity went up and down due to the solar cycle. 
and as it's arrived to the last layers of our heliosphere, before crossing out of the heliosphere, the intensity went way up. If you look at the intensity in the interstellar medium, outside of our heliosphere is 75% higher than what we measure here. This is a clear plot that show the filtration or the effect of the heliosphere. The heliosphere also shield um, the planets from dust, but I'm not going to show uh, this plot. So clearly, if you want to understand what happened in planets inside stellar systems, you need to understand the effects of astrospheres. Um, the other point that I wanted to mention, we probably will find life in other planets. Well, this is the goal of uh, astronomy and exoplanetary research. But right now, we are the only one that we know have life. So the heliosphere, the properties of our astrosphere, are critical for us to understand if we want to understand what make astrosphere habitable. Whether the shielding properties of dust, radiation, what happened in the past, what will happen in the future, do we understand what the heliosphere um, look like? And we learn a whole lot in space physics from missions like Voyager and others. So we learn a whole lot about the heliosphere, but there are many other puzzles. And as John said, I'm leading a center, I will show you in a minute, to try to understand some of these remaining puzzles. I wanted to play you a movie that show one of the puzzles that my group uh, kind of started a whole controversy back in 2015, saying perhaps the heliosphere is not a comet-like shape, but look like this a croissant-like um, figure. And this still is really hotly debated within the community, but it brings home the fact that not even the shape of our astrosphere we know. And so this is one of the big questions in the community. This is the croissant shape that I mentioned. And if you Google, if you go Google heliosphere, NASA, the prototype image that come from NASA is a comet-like, is a sun with a long tail that extends very much, if I go back here, one of these examples like that is a comet-like shape extending. But you see other astrospheres that look different. We would like to know what our heliosphere look like. So we also put forward in 2020, this is the work I did here in Harvard in my sabbatical with Avi Leib and others, the idea that this croissant is actually deflated because part of the energy gets extracted. And if you ask me a question at the end, I can go back to it. And nature saw me call it a crescent shape, heliosphere. This is part of the questions that my center that I am leading is trying to answer the shape of the heliosphere. And I am just showing this slide to impress upon you. There are so many other questions fundamentally that we don't understand what um, are the physical characteristics of the heliosphere. And we are trying to solve it. This is a huge multidisciplinary center that NASA just funded us for five years um, with lots of money, lots of people, so we better produce something. <laughs> and those are the research thrust. Part of the questions is the stellar wind that come from the sun is very different at large distances um, versus close. This also means that in general, in stars, we don't understand the winds that they power and how they evolve from close to the star to farther out. So this is part of uh, the puzzles. We have lots of theory, modeling, observations, trying to put together and come up with good answers. If you want, you can check our website and contact me if you want to collaborate. Or... But let me go back to this talk. So while I have all this center thinking about it, I'm off to the side thinking, with what we know about the heliosphere, can we tell something about evolution of climate in the past or in the future? So this is um, relating um, three different disciplines. So let me walk through some of the ingredients that made me um, um, arrive to these conclusions. One, I just wanted to show this very famous plot that you probably saw many, many times. It's a very impressive one that plot the temperature, and the, I will talk about it more at the end of my talk, um, 
how this temperature is extracted um, from foraminifera in the deep ocean. It's an incredible science that they can tell the temperature of Earth back a million years. I was blown away when I learned that. So you can see here from today, going back to 60 million years ago, they can tell what the temperature was in the deep ocean and then translate it to the atmosphere. And so here are the different um, eras, and you can see based on these proxies for the temperature that the temperature was hotter um, 60 million years ago, and, and there was a whole trend of cooling. There is lots of fluctuation, especially in the last 10 million, a, a much stronger cooling to the ice age. And, and of course, here is what everybody's worried, the anthropogenic climate crisis, that you can see the temperature increasing. And if you compare to um, variations in the last 60 million, this is happening much faster and much more dramatic. So it's a crisis that we're trying to deal. I'm not going to talk about um, consequences for anthropogenic crisis. I'm going to talk about what happened in the past couple of million years. And I have to say there are many explanations for the fluctuations in the temperature, and they're probably valid. They probably need to be explored. However, I'm going to try to convince you that the location of the sun and the location of Earth probably contributed to this curve and should be accounted for. So if it's success of my talk, you come out of this lecture thinking it's an interesting venue to explore. So one of the things we know from the heliospheric community that the heliosphere as we know today, here I'm showing a cross section of my Coruscant heliosphere, but this is the sun, this is the motion that we're moving through the interstellar medium. Um, and the size of it is around, at least in the nose area where we're moving, around 200 astronomical unit, okay? And we know that this position is based by pressure balance between what the sun output and the pressure from the interstellar medium. And we, right now, we are embedded, this number you can um, argue on that, but we're embedded in a partially ionized interstellar medium. So when you calculate the pressures outside for magnetic field, temperature, um, and uh, neutrals charge exchanging, you get this position 200 AU. There are works like Hans Mueller and others that study what will happen if, for example, we were embedded at an interstellar medium with 100 times um, more hydrogen atoms. And you can see that the, the, the nose of the heliosphere, sorry, now it's inverted the other way, this is the nose, the direction we are moving through the interstellar medium, moved to 23 AU. So right around Saturn and the other planets are out in the interstellar medium, but the heliosphere still protect Earth. Right? And the other work that I want to mention, and this is Florinsky and Gary Zank and others, looked about the filtration of the galactic cosmic rays that I mentioned at the beginning. This is in black here, the pristine, uh, the black, the pristine, the, the, what we think is the um, um, intensity of galactic cosmic rays outside the heliosphere. And in lower energies, below 1 GeV, they get filtered by the heliosphere. So they run lots of cases for different heliospheres. Maybe I will try this, it would be a better. But they run for different types of heliospheres and you can see that the shielding will vary, right? So this is all uh, known. There is other works by um, Martin Rees and Begelman and Farr and Yegi Khan suggesting that maybe the heliosphere would have encountered some heavy molecular clouds. And statistically, they were trying to say how often this will be and the consequences of that. Okay, so this is in, in background. The other background I just wanted to mention that the astronomy effects are included in climate models. But what is included is what we call the Milankovitch cycles. The fact that the tilt of Earth vary. So you get more or less um, light and this will affect directly the climate. So you can see here, I think I'm going, I'm too short to do the, 
this thick. But you can see here the eccentricity varying of Earth, and, and they include that in the temperature, the oscillation. This is benthic, the temperature in the deep ocean. So they include that, the important piece of it, that the variations are around 10,000 um, years, and they correlate that with time on Earth, arid or wet climate, saying this is to do to the variation of axis, right? So this is well accepted in the climate community, but no other effect is well accepted or included in climate models. Um, before I go on to my topic, I just also want to mention there are other works like Neil Shaviv and collaborators that suggested maybe every 300 million years there will be more or less galactic cosmic rays because we will go in and out of the spiral arms and they try to relate galactic cosmic rays to cloud coverage to climate. This is a more loose connection. It's really not proven that you have more radiation, more cloud coverage, but this is an interesting suggestion. Um, the important part that what is not included in climate is what happened where Earth was million years ago, where the sun was. And I'm going to try my takeaway messages here to convince you that now we have this heliosphere on around from tail to nose, around 1,000 of you. But when you go back in time, at least two occasions, I'm going to try to convince you the sun and the solar system was in contact with much denser environments that pushed the heliosphere to sub-AU scales. And why it's important? Because if it's sub-AU scales, it means the Earth was exposed directly to massive hydrogen atoms. So we will end exposed directly to radiation unfiltered by the heliosphere, okay? So I'm going to tell you the story about these two events. Maybe there are others, but those are the two that we're tracking back in time. How this idea came about came from this plot that I have seen, and I was like, wow, this is, I think, where I should go. There are those measurements, and what is impressive of that, that those measurements um, were done everywhere, in ocean samples, in Antarctic snow, on the moon, galactic cosmic rays, measuring an abundance of iron-60. And you can, the iron-60 is produced by supernova explosions. And you measure in all these places, uh, it's, it's a very hard measurement. They take the samples, they run it. This mostly the guy from Austria, Warner, that does it in um, this um, mass, um, high precision mass spectrometry. But they get um, an, an higher abundance of iron 60 around two to three million years ago and seven million years ago. The end, there is, an in, there is a hint of an increase here, but they can only go back 10 million years in, with these measurements. So the, the question is, what made Earth collect more iron-60 during those periods? And the running th scenario that people um, being um, using to explain the iron-60 data that because it's produced by supernova, perhaps a supernova exploded outside the heliosphere, pushed it in, and was trapped in dust, and the dust um, rained on Earth, and ended up in, the, in all these different samples, and also rained on the moon, right? There are a couple of problems with this scenario. One is that you have to fine tune where you explode the supernova. You cannot explode too close if not, you have a mass extinction. So closer to eight parsec, you can't. It has to be larger than um, eight parsec or 10 parsec. Um, the other um, question, especially I'm going to mention it a little later, um, the work that Alisa Goodman and her team did here, led by Catherine Zucker, saying that all the indications that the local bubble, and I will mention what it is in a minute, formed farther away from us, way farther away. So the last big explosions of supernova happened 14 million years ago, far from us. And then you might say, this is still fine, but you still need to explain how you will trap the iron sticks in dust and make it come exactly on this time, two to seven million years. So we explored a different scenario. Um, 
we explored the fact that the interstellar medium is not homogeneous. And perhaps the sun or Earth met conditions that made heliosphere shrink. So one of the things to realize, the sun is located um, um, inside right now, I will mention this later in the talk, inside this big structure called the local bubble. It's around 200 parsec in each direction. Um, and within the region, just outside of the heliosphere, there are all these different clouds. Those are within 15 parsec, but smaller than 200 parsec, that were mapped by Seth Redfield and Jeff Linsky in several um, great works. What, what is interesting why I'm showing that, that even within 15 parsec, interstellar medium is very heterogeneous is not a homogeneous, quiet place. The other thing to realize, the sun moves 18 parsec every million years. So if you're thinking about three million years, you need to look at a much, much larger volume, still within local bubble, but ask yourself what exists around the sun within 40 parsec of a volume. So I, I set to do this expedition it's a long story, I, um, how the, my collaborators came together with me to work on that, but we think the end of the story, we think the sun encounter this cloud here, and I will tell you uh, the story of that, called local links of code cloud. Um, so when I started thinking and looking around within 40 parsec, I noticed that there is this big structure that was described by HOD 2010. And those, these big structures occupy almost 90 degrees in the sky, um, has a distance between 11 to 45 parsec from us. It, there is an uncertainty on the distance. Um, there, it's made of cold clouds, and especially this one that is big enough was studied in detail, both by Josh Peak and others and Mayer, and they derive a really high density. Remember that right now we are located on interstellar mediums that has a density of 0 0.1 hydrogen per centimeter cube. This is 3,000, okay? And a very cold um, um, 20 Kelvin. We don't understand the origin of this and how it's evolved, but it's there. And it's very smooth, so we think that these other structures have similar densities. So I, I, I had this hypothesis that we encounter this um, local ribbon. And actually, that is a funny story. Josh Peak heard me talking about it. He had COVID, so he had time to look at that. And he called me and he said, I said to prove you wrong, but he did the analysis that I'm going to show you and realized, yes, indeed, we had crossed that. But we crossed the, the tail end. I thought what may be here but he in fact showed that most likely we cross the tail end. So the analysis that I'm going to show you um, make the point that we probably cross within one sigma. This is a one sigma error that Josh derived on the very tail end. And this crossing happened exactly where I was looking for two million years ago. Um, so the LR, the local ribbon of code cloud is very smooth. And what Josh did, he modeled it as a rigid body. This is an assumption. It's a rigid body moving. And he used this um, all-sky survey. Um, if you have questions, ask him for more details. But he reproduced the, the local ribbon with this new data, the local ribbon of code clouds. And he derived the 3D components, assuming he had to assume that this is a rigid body to derive the 3D component. And this is an image of the tail end where we think we crossed. And what he derived the 3D component and uh, the subtraction from the motion of the sun, remember we move 18 parsec every million years. Then relative speed, uh, we have this components, and when we run it back in time, we can see it's, we are intersecting within one sigma. Um, I have an, a cute movie that Catherine Zucker so nicely produced for me. Um, I'm going to play it twice, but just before I, I play, I will show you, I will tell you what it is. 
and yellow is a trajectory of the sun, each red dot here is a distance, because we don't know the distance of um, the local ribbon of cold clouds, it's between 10 to 45 parsec. This includes random draw for possible distance and includes the uncertainty that Josh derived for the speed. And if you play it, you see back six million was far away, and as you see how the sun right around here, that is three million to two million, one of these trajectories of the very tail end would have intercepted. So right now, this is a local ribbon of cold cloud, and all the possible distance and velocity. And again, opa, if I play, you can see that you, you look at the sun, one, the, 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 within one sigma, the sun will intercept one of um, the possible trajectories of the very tail end that we are calling the local Linux of code cloud because it's against the constellation of Linux. And so what I did was to take the relative speed that Josh derived and run our simulations with all what we know about the heliosphere and see, can we push the heliosphere to sub-AU scales? Um, I took the density of the local Leo cloud, saying that all the ribbon is a very smooth um, structure, so the density will be similar to that. So I took the density and the relative speed, and in the frame of reference of the sun, the sun is here, the heliosphere shrink to 0.2 AU well within um, one AU scales, has its very long tail, you can ask me questions, it seem, it's not a croissant shape, and I can explain why, but it's a long tail here, but at the nose, it's a 0.2 AU, and here are more physical quantities, I will skip that. What is interesting in 3D, if you plot the heliosphere in yellow, um, and this is in three dimensions, the galactic coordinates transform to the system of reference of the sun, we, we collided in this plane. So this is a plane of the planets. So our motion, that, that direction is important. So we collided in this direction, it's mean that Earth was in and out. If you look from top down, from the rotation axis of the sun, this is the trajectory of Earth um, in the interstellar medium naked, without heliosphere and entering into the heliosphere, being protected some pieces, some portion of the time, but then diving into the interstellar medium for most of its trajectory. Of course, this will last while we are encountering that cold cloud. Once the cold cloud goes away, the heliosphere will expand again. I will talk about the consequences of that at the end of the talk, because this explains the first peak, right? We were exposed to the interstellar medium. The second peak, when I looked at that, and actually that was also a fun story, I gave the Radcliffe talk, and Alyssa Goodman came, and I told her, we crossed the local bubble at seven million. She said, I think so. So we started collaborating with her group on, and why I thought was we crossed, because it's 18 parsec per million years. Multiply just the number, the extent of the local bubble, it's close to the edge. It's too much of a coincidence. So we started, this is the second work that I am doing with Catherine Zucker, Josh Peake, and the whole shebang of Alisa Goodman group. Um, the fact that seven million years ago, we probably crossed the edge, and I will explain this work. The other interesting thing that will come in a bit is that um, Catherine Zucker, um, and when she did the work in 2020 mapping the local bubble, um, mapped that all the star forming regions, the molecular clouds, lie on the edge. Okay, so this is a movie from Catherine again, and showing the origin. This was from the press release that they had about the local bubble, and they derived in their paper that the origin of the local bubble happened around 300 parsec away from the sun. And it's happened 14 million years ago, not just one supernova, but a couple of supernova exploded and forming um, this big shell that expanded. And as expanded, star forming regions appeared at the edge. 
and somewhere um, the sun was outside and was moving. As this was expanding farther away, in some point, in their paper they said five million years, the sun crossed into it. So when I started working, and you can see all the stuff forming regions, I asked her, is it possible for us to revisit that calculation? Maybe it was not five, maybe it was seven. What were the assumptions that you guys did? So I, I worked, and this is in our paper. If you ask me, I can send you the preprint. But I work with Catherine and uh, Ralph here in deriving the, the relative, the local bubble is very irregular. In their paper, they assumed a spherical expansion. So I asked them to revisit it on the direction of the sun if the local bubble um, probably was more extended or less extended, can you get the time? And they derived a crossing time of 6.8, including um, all the irregularities of the local bubble that again match what I was looking for the iron 60 and they derive an expansion of the speed towards the sun with these numbers we take the solar motion so we get a relative speed between the sun and the expansion of the bubble of 32 kilometers per second a little bit I have to say that is this is on a higher number now we move through the interstellar medium with 25 kilometers. This is a little bit higher, but it's still reasonable. Um, the other thing that it's an assumption is which density I'm going to use for the edge. I took a density that is high. And the reason for that, first of all, I, am, I, I need to push the heliosphere to sub-AU scales. And the reason I justify that, because if you go back to, oops, to the local bubble um, uh, derivation that Catherine Zucker and the team had, all the stars that are forming are on the edge. The edge has to be massive to form stars. Has to be massive and cold. What the density is, we don't know. The other, the other um, reason for that, so like I said, all the nearby molecular clouds are there at the edge. I have to say that on the direction of the sun right now, there is no molecular cloud that we can see. Doesn't mean that in the past one of the structure was not moving. And molecular clouds are even more massive than what I need. I need a portion that to be a little denser, right? The regular interstellar medium. Um, the other interesting um, um, aspect, and there are others more expert than me, but when two flows collide, you have thermal instabilities that can happen, and one of them, this is Shmuel Biali sent me, um, you have this formation of really high cores of much, dense, much higher density than um, the background interstellar medium, and we think that the um, local bubble edge was slamming against the interstellar medium, so maybe there was fragmentation even locally higher density. In any case, I assume, you might say, it's not a good assumption, a 900 um, particles per centimeter cube, and I take the um, relative speed that they provide me between our motion and the, um, um, here, let me go back, in the local edge that give me the crossing time that I needed. Uh, so I take the 32 kilometers per second with all the um, different um, coordinates, and what is interesting this is in the heliospheric um, reference. So the sun is here, and we were colliding with the local bubble with an edge. The planets are here on z equals zero. So we collided within an edge with a 900 is sufficient to bring the heliosphere to 0.7 AU to sub-AU scales. Um, so for these densities that I chose, uh, Mars and Earth and the rest are outside, and the other planets are inside. Would be really cool to have planetary samples that can distinguish that some planets were exposed while others were not. This is for future sample returns. But this says, this particular simulation, that both Earth and Mars were outside, while Venus, Mercury were inside, protected. Um, in 3D, you can see the long heliosphere and the planets are in this plane. 
So again, if you look top down, Earth was most of its trajectory outside, but sometimes were inside protected. Now, let me talk to them, let me go to, to the future directions. This is not research we have done yet, but this is research I've been discussing with my Radcliffe Fellows. We propose an exploratory seminar to study it with other experts. If you're interested in collaborating with us, come talk to me. But we are trying to figure out the several effects, both in climate and radiation, for these two particular periods, three million years and seven million years, where Earth was exposed to the interstellar medium. So let me throw some ideas and, and discuss some, some of the consequences. Um, let's talk about the climate in the past. So that is a similar um, graph that I showed at the beginning. And like I said, you can infer the temperature of the past Earth from these structures called foraminifera. I love them. They kind of build rooms. As they age, they build rooms. So they are expanding their house. So you can tell the age of foraminifera by the amount of rooms that they have. So you know the age. Now you measure the isotope of O18, O16. This can give you the temperature because isotopes are sensitive to temperature, the most massive in terms of evaporation. So you can um, look at this ratio O18, O16, and when it's higher, mean colder. So it's a cooler temperature in the deep ocean. There is a whole uncertainty of taking deep ocean temperature and bringing to the atmosphere. Another can of worms. But this is the temperature in the deep ocean and show these oscillations. If you ask pure climate people that haven't thought where the sun is located, they will tell you that each of these wiggles, they have lots of explanations. And when you read papers, they have sometimes multiple explanations for the same phenomena. There need to be more quantitative work to really tell, um, can all this explain all of them or you need something else? I am proposing that at least during 3 million and 7 million, there was an effect that should be included in this graph, where we, lo where we were located. Um, so again, this is the same thing that I said at the beginning. They do include um, the change in eccentricity and obliquity. But those are much shorter time scales, 10,000. OK, when you go back to the literature, there are some works that looked what will happen if suddenly you have massive hydrogen atoms raining on the atmosphere. One of them is McKay and Thomas is, is old, 78. Hans Farr and Yegikan get similar conclusions. But those are actually are the only two quantitative works that exist. So my next direction is to get modern atmospheric model to revisit that problem. But they do the whole chemistry. You need to do the chemistry. You need to put the whole hydrogen and figure out what happened. And they get the conclusion that the mid um, um, atmosphere, the mesosphere, um, get heavily de depleted, the ozone, but not the ozone that we're used to low in, in, in low heights, in mid latitude, much higher, get depleted. And they have a whole argument that actually you form a lot of water. And this water is cold. So they argue for a cooling, for a, a global cooling. What is interesting, too, that if you go back to this era, this is when um, the atmospheric models argue for a global cooling. This is seen both in the north and the southern hemisphere, global cooling. Um, OK, this is a future direction. The other thing that is interesting that I explored in Radcliffe reading all the literature, that there is a whole literature um, looking into the connection of climate and human evolution. And there is a whole National um, Academy report talking about it. What is interesting that around three million years ago, Australopithecus afarensis went extinct. And our lineage started appearing, the Homo sapiens. The argument that they make, and here again, the wet dry cycle due to the change in axis, that Africa started, the African land became much more arid, the climate much more unstable, and the human evolution was driven to leave Africa and start exploring other areas on the planets where they can adapt 
to a better climate. So their argument based on not just humans, but bovids and, and plants, is that there was a major diversification in the climate, and this forced species that were more adaptable, like us, homo sapiens, um, to evolve. It's an interesting inspiration to think if our location in the interstellar medium affected climate, and this is for the future, we might have affected indirectly some evolution that happened on Earth. Um, and in fact, they show plots like that, that in particularly 7 million, this is a local bubble, and the 3 million, the lo um, local Linux, there was a lot of fluctuations, much larger fluctuations than before seen in climate. Um, it's not clear what provoked those fluctuations, but there are several papers arguing that those climate um, drove evolution on Earth. Um, the other effect that will happen, not just by raining massive atoms of hydrogen, is increased radiation. If we are exposed to the pristine interstellar medium, we are receiving the full blunt of the radiation. So we have 80% more from the heliosphere. Also, another area to be explored, what happened to our magnetosphere. Earth is shielded by a magnetic field. This magnetic field now is slamming against the interstellar medium that has its magnetic field. What will happen to our magnetosphere? Still to be known, but the magnetosphere shield the extra portion of the galactic cosmic rays. So you can easily convince yourself that there will be more radiation. How much? Still to be calculated. But what is the effect of radiation? And this is a, a work I've been talking to Evan Economo that is an expert on uh, genes and diversification. What is interesting that they know that radiation, and this plot, I love this plot, this is from Cusinota looking at the effect of radiation in cells. If you look at low energy uh, radiation, you see this Christmas tree in the cell. You zap a cell with radiation, it's light up. If you go to the high Z, the, the high charge galactic cosmic rays, it's like bands, it's like trail where the radiation went. Why this is interesting? Because the cell, when it's exposed to radiation, have a way to try to correct itself. There will be mutations, and there are two different mutations. One, somatic. Somatic lead to aging, to cancer. But somatic don't pass to the next generation. They might extinct a population, they might age a population, but they don't pass to the next generation. Germline pass. So understanding what happened with the germline mutation, I think it would be super exciting. If we can figure out today and go back, um, this is what Evan does, go back to say three million years ago, we have an indication that there was more radiation. That would be really cool. Um, with the problem with that, there are a couple of problems. One, we really don't understand mutation and radiation. Even though we are going to send astronauts to the moon and Mars, this is an open area of the low-grade galactic cosmic rays. What the effect on mutation? And the other piece that related with this plot is when you have radiation, when you have mutations, or even without radiation, mutations, you make a mistake, the DNA try to correct itself. That self-correcting mechanism is not well understood. So it's hard for us to know. We know the German line um, correct itself better than other ones. They are more immune to radiation, but how much we really don't know. So this is an open area. We are interested. And my last slide is I want to impress upon you that either the effect on climate or radiation, I think it's a future frontier for us to explore and see what happened three million years ago, seven million years ago to the climate and to the radiation. And the question is, can we understand the extent in which the Earth's history in the past and in the future is linked where the sun was in the interstellar medium? So before I finish, I have my slide that I always show, both my Radcliffe talks and every talk about diversity. This idea to bring different fields together that was the core of Radcliffe. 
It's also the core of SHIELD. You can see me in the Voyager team, not a lot of diversity. And I think in space physics, I know by my career, and I try within my center to bring more diverse voices. So then you can start having crazy ideas like this talk, right? Thank you. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, one was, uh, we, it looked like we were, the Earth was inside the, the cloud for a few months and then outside for, so what's the time scale for the heliosphere to change its size? Is it very it's, quick? So we think, uh, again, it's the, um, the um, size of the clouds. And it's come down, and you can calculate that the main, <coughs> here, let me go back here. It can vary by million years. It's the, the question is the speed we are moving with respect no, no, to the no, cloud? That is the, that's the Earth's orbit. That is the Earth's orbit, right. So we're right. inside the cloud for a few months, few and then months. we're outside right. for eight right. months, say. Right. Is that quick enough? Because does the heliosphere collapse quick enough for that to have an effect, I guess, for those few months we're in the cloud? Yes, absolutely. No, it because it will collapse, we will stay like that, depending on the size of the cloud. Mm. And as we're moving through the cloud, and this will be much larger the time scale than the time that we are doing that. Yes? Um, I was wondering whether, well first I was, I guess I was wondering about the 160 lines, and I was wondering in that plot how much of that width that we see around those peaks is real, I feel like physical width? Uh, yeah, that does is, that tell us about like the time scale of any of these things, or is that like a measurement? It's a, I, I don't know. I yeah. am talking to Wano to try to understand the width. I know. Um, it's, it's super interesting, and if you can see back, the 7 million is much thinner yeah, than this exactly. one. So I am trying to talk to him to understand yeah. if that tells us how long we were. The, the other aspect, if we are inside do we still get some effects yeah. from iron being close to us? I don't know. Okay. Right. I, I didn't touch on that. Right. This is connected in my mind, and hopefully you'll see it too. Um, if we have stars that are a little bit more massive or a little bit less massive, they have potentially pretty different winds. And then, right. So what do you, could you speculate a little bit about what that might mean about like planetary systems around five solar mass stars versus you know, 0.1 solar mass stars as they move through this? You probably can do a back on the calculations and, and start having an idea. Actually, this was a question we were talking just before. Yeah. Um, the beginning of my talk, the consequences in general for habitability for, ex for other planetary systems. You can speculate that if Earth went through these phases that were outside with more radiation and more hydrogen atoms, other planets will be. Now, the, the shrinking um, the heliosphere, the size from uh, 200 AU to less than a yeah. U, it's set by the wind of the sun, but the largest effect is a variation in interstellar medium environment. So I will imagine that if you have a more massive star, you will have a much bigger astrosphere, but still you can do by ram pressure calculations and figure out which ISM you need to start pushing the certain planetary system but you could probably do an inference that planets, and the outer planets, probably are, uh, were exposed to ISM much more than the inner planets. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Evgenia. Remarkably clear. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, I have a whole list of questions that I'll get to later with you. But um, what do we know about the evolution of the Earth's magnetosphere on these time scales? And what does that uncertainty tell you about these potential detections or measurements? Short answer, I don't know. It's, it's something I'm starting to collaborate. Um, so NASA funded three centers. 
And one is us, the shield, and the other center is doing magnetosphere with my ex-student doing the simulations. So I started talking to him exactly about that. Can we simulate the interaction? But you touched on the crux that I was exactly going to investigate with him the evolution of the magnetic field. It's, it's a fair question, right? I have a question from the chat from Steve Saar. How much does the heliospheric, heliospheric shielding change over the solar cycle? So that is, a, you know, when you, you ask a question close to what you know best, it's the hardest to answer. Um, OK, let me go in. A, in a, I don't think it's changed that much. But we don't really know um, enough for me to give. OK, let me go back to this slide here. What Stephen is asking is, as the sun evolve and have different magnetic fields, different winds, well, whether this boundary is going to move in and out. OK, so the short, quick answer that we don't understand this 70% shielding. So that drop in the galactic cosmic rays is one of the questions we're trying to answer. We are not at the point to be predictable besides where Voyager crossed to tell in a different time scale what would be the shielding. And part of it, that they're super sensitive to these last layers. So as the sun evolves and the solar cycle have different magnetic fields, the structure, the turbulence here, the magnetic orientation will change. So we know inside at one EU that there is these variations. But on, on these last layers, we don't know. And so I will leave it at that. <laughs> Amesh. So you know, just intuitively, it seems to me that the shape of this uh, heliosphere, the nose, should depend on which way the ISM magnetic field is oriented Absolutely. relative to the velocity, the yeah, plane yeah. of the ecliptic, all this stuff. So and I presume you can do simulations to work that out. And maybe you don't get a cross out every time. But uh, do we know what the magnetic field orientation is outside I have, the sun? I, I, I have the how does it vary over the last 7 million years or whatever? Uh, super interesting question. I had some slides that I took out. Let me. Um, uh, maybe I can wave my hands with this. Okay, so the core sun in itself, it's set by the magnetic field of the sun. It's, it's due to the magnetic tension. It's basically the, I taught it in my class today, the tension is that even though it's a high beta plasma, the heliosheet, the tension is um, proportional to the ramp pressure in the heliosheet. The flows are slow. So the tension resists the stretching, and make this skeleton of the heliosphere. So this will exist always, OK? It's just by the intensity of the solar magnetic field resisting. Now, we have done lots of simulations. We have shown many years ago that the interstellar magnetic field is like a compass. The whole structure goes sidewise depending on the interstellar magnetic field. And so it will go by 60 degrees if you go that way, the magnetic field it, is going to change. We do have, so in the past years, we had indications from the Voyager spacecraft where the field was. There is our new measurement by another spacecraft, IBEX, that indicates slightly different direction. There are some assumptions on that. So I think within the community, there is a little controversial what the field is in terms of intensity of direction. They seem to agree that within more or less 60 degrees from the galactic plane, and that the intensity is between 3.5 to 4 microgauss, because this is in agreement with the in situ measurement of the field intensity. So we think it's a little higher than the, what you would expect, maybe 1 microgauss. It's 4 microgauss, and it's not in the galactic plane. Now, the question is how far it extends. So that is a, is a controversy because the medium outside of the heliosphere 
Um, there is a leak cloud, the G cloud, there's lots of clouds. And the question is, does this magnetic field get affected by the draping of them? The R works by John had collaborated with Priscilla Frisch looking at much larger directions and she argued that the same direction that we measure extend to much larger scales. But this is um, um, work based on polarimeter of dust. But it also means that the turbulence, it's not that strong to change that direction. But it's interesting that this independent astrophysical measurement orientation agrees with what the satellite is telling you. Right, That's right. <laughs> the other thing I've been discussing with Alisa Goodman and her group is we wanted, in this simulation, I didn't put magnetic field in the local bubble. But the question is orientation of the magnetic field in the local bubble. And for the magnetosphere would be super important if there is any reconnection, what is the magnetic field between these two? All right, I've got a question. Yes. So, you know, in our hemisphere, a lot of the ramp pressure is thrown right away by the ions hitting the, the hemispheric magnetic field, right? The ions from the interstellar medium. Like when it's all neutral, then all that's going to flow right past that until it gets ionized, right? So the, the pressure is going to be felt by like pickup ions, and it's going to be felt. So that, that you ask, uh, when I started simulating that, my intuition was exactly like you. But then it's actually different. The, um, so we are used to charge exchange that has a mean free pass to 100 EU. But when the densities are so high, the, the, the mean free pass is a fraction of EU. So uh, let me show you. I skipped it here. Look, it's actually the heliopause goes to zero. The main free pass here, once they start sensing the ions, it's block, it's a wall. But this because the hydrogen is so high. So you have to just to put the numbers to convince yourself that you're, you're going a total different phase space. It's not 100 AU, it's 0 0.01 AU. <laughs> I was looking to John, I thought, no? Well, okay, this is for me rather than John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the question is that the wall of the local bubble is mostly swept up ISM rather than supernova debris. So how much would the increase in iron 60 really be from going through a dense uh, region? We there? didn't calculate it yet, the um, increase in abundance. You can see the peak in the seven, um, because there are a couple of steps. If it's swept, if it's a, it's a, um, hold on. We started this calculation, I have to revisit it. Where is it? Um, ah, here. This peak is smaller, and this is part of what I, I'm interested in looking. I haven't calculated. But you have two steps here. One, it's a swept ISM, and then it's a, um, um, if we argue that you need a higher density on the edge to bring to sub EU scales, it's a clump that condensed. So you need to do how much, you can probably do it in the back of the envelope, how much of iron 60 you need, and as you collapse it into a particular cloud, what will be the abundance? We haven't done it yet. Or oh, I started, but I have to revisit. But ultimately, it would be nice to be consistent with the speaks. Thank you. <laughs>